Welcome to both success and integrity with Bessie Graham, a podcast dedicated to established business leaders like you, ready to bring more meaning into your life in a way that strengthens rather than threatens the financial stability of your business. I'm your host, Bessie Graham. I've worked with business owners, governments, and large funding bodies like the United Nations for over 20 years to bring doing good and making money back together. So let's unpack why you don't have to choose between experiencing success or having integrity in your life. Thank you for uh, joining me on the podcast today, Brad. I'm a little bit excited to have you with me. Very, uh, very welcome. And I'm excited to, to be here and be in conversation with you. It's, it's really lovely. Yeah. The, um, I probably, I would have lost count of how many times while I've been doing the podcast, I've said, as Brad says, or Brad always, <laughs> I stole this idea from Brad. Um, Still haven't seen the payments. <laughs> The lots of, if not all of my good ideas are, uh, have a seed rooted in a conversation that, you know, we've had or an influence that you've had on my thinking. And I wanted to just explore a little bit today how we can get a better understanding of two ideas that I've brought up in the podcast, but that I've kind of only done a surface level conversation around. And those uh, relate to two of the things that I think people need to um, be more conscious of or have at the front of their minds when they're doing work, trying to have a positive impact in the world. And that is the concepts of having a designerly disposition, but then also remembering that when you are raising expectations, mucking with people's lives or with the complexity of, you know, something that might have serious environmental impacts, Mm -hmm. the concept that Rattel brought up around wicked problems of having no right to be wrong. And so I, I don't mind how we kind of flow into that, but, but wanting to maybe even just start with, with either of those concepts, are there things that you've seen people often misunderstand or you know like where would you start if you were thinking about those topics and and how someone needs to think about them so yeah thank you um i think both of those topics are on their own are um really really fascinating a whole podcast a whole podcast exactly (laughs) which uh yes just uh watch the space um but in juxtaposition, they are, I think, particularly interesting and particularly uh, potent as, as, as ideas. But uh, perhaps just to start by pulling them apart a little bit, I'd like to maybe start with Wicked Problems. Um, it's, uh, it's a delightful, delightful naming. I've always enjoyed the idea of, 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 of wicked, wicked Problems as a way of naming uh, a particular kind of class of problems. Uh, it's not new. It's it's nearly fifty years old. It was introduced in the early seventies by Rattel and Weber in a in an academic um, uh, article. And my uh, interpretation of what they were trying to do was to answer, I think, or at least um, uh, firing it fire a little bit of a warning shot across the bowels of. Uh, system science. So system science had developed very strongly in the 50s and 60s. It had come out of the operations research methodologies that were developed during the war to try and accelerate weapons manufacture. And uh, as more and more work was done, the, the attitude, if you like, or the culture of system science was that we can pretty much tackle any system. And what Rattel and Weber were, were saying was, well, actually, no. There's this class of problems, and they use the term class, and they use the term social, so a class of social problems that they termed wicked, that uh, are not soluble to um, the, 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 the more technical methods of, uh, of, of, of the system sciences. It's interesting because 
when you go into some of the aspects that explain, you know, what they were responding to or trying to have that warning against, uh, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. And yet one of the tricky bits is because it is a technical paper, as you said, and there's sort of, you know, some aspects to it that I think a lot of people who have in the last, you know, more recent years, particularly the last 10 years, grabbed onto that concept of wicked problems without actually the um, understanding or reading into the, the depth of it. That's probably where a bunch of the almost misunderstandings or the making it quite simplistic rather than simple. So I've often said to you, I remember years ago, back when I used to use Twitter, seeing someone's Twitter handle and it said, you know, Bessie Graham, I solve wicked problems. And I was like, oh my gosh, you can't say you solve wicked problems. Yes. Like, yes. But there is that misunderstanding. So it's kind of this beautiful, rich piece, as you said, yeah. and yet in its the kind of massiveness of what they're trying to do, people have latched on and probably missed some of the points. Yes, yeah. So the um, I think if you Google wicked problems you know it's very um it comes up very quickly that people talk about we solve wicked problems or you know, the solution to wicked problems and even though that term is used in the original paper uh, it's it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what wicked problems are and and i like to uh to um invoke uh the design philosopher richard buchanan's um naming uh alongside wicked problems uh which was which is indeterminate problems or indeterminacy which is a john dewey concept again a, a u.s um early 20th century philosopher but if we draw the distinction between determinate problems and indeterminate problems we can start to understand that talking about solution in the in in the space of indeterminacy is is actually profoundly profoundly wrong and will lead to frustration and hurt and harm and all those sorts of things. So can I ask a question then? So in terms of some of the the naming or the, the use of different words, is something like determinacy, indeterminacy, is that similar to when people make a distinction between something being complicated or complex or like are they – are there some comparisons or overlap there with those ideas or, or what's meant, in, meant uh, by that? I, I think so. I think uh, if I like to, you know, different terms can map different conceptual territories and different people will have different mappings, but I often draw the distinction between complicated and complex in that um, a piece of machinery can be very complicated, but it is, uh, it is stable, it is, it is determinable. I can pull it apart, I can draw a schematic for it, and if I put it on a shelf and come back in a year, it's going to be exactly exactly the same. Whereas complexity is something that has um, uh, an inherent uh, dynamic quality. It's always in motion. The, the number of possible interactions really exceed the limits of calculation. And so a, a, I can maybe get my head around or my hands on a small complex system, but once you get to large complex systems, then you're getting to this, this realm of practical incalculability. But I think indeterminacy um, has its own um, quality. It's not just merely complex. It is accepting very at a very deep uh, level that you will never know enough about that particular system it is it is there is far too much information there is it is in far too much motion uh that um it just defeats the limits of practical um, calculation so you've got to you've got to come at it with a very different um fundamental uh attitude i think that uh it's interesting because even as you're describing that and the realities of trying to intervene or influence or have some kind of change occur in that type of system or with that type of problem, it does come back to the, the whole 
foundation of this podcast and of the mindset we're trying to get people to have in terms of that both end piece. So like, Mm. because even as you describe that, so much of the the aspects that we're trying to get someone to think about in their business model and thinking of creating a win-win is to say no one person or one organization can be the answer to something as it gets more complex or it moves into indeterminacy. And so I think all of these ideas and, and as you're listening, if it's feeling like, oh gosh, there's like lots of new people I don't know about this thinker or I haven't read that the piece to sort of just come back to is using these as just ideas that are uh, you know or seeds that are being planted to be the reminder of in anything we're doing where we're trying to make sure a we've kind of named something correctly but b that we are having the right mix whether that is the right input from different skill sets or different people, different organizations, or even if it is simply the stance we're taking of how we're looking at and naming what it is we're trying to do, which I think sort of probably comes into the the part of Wicked Problems um, that comes up the most and that I think helps us be more responsible as we do intervene around that idea of the no right to be wrong piece and, and, and how does that fit? Yes. So um, if I can, I'll just, if I can just push, press pause on that for a moment. I think one of the, if, if you um, take on board this idea of, of, of the indeterminacy of wicked, uh, of, of wicked spaces, wicked, wicked problems, in a way it's, there's a, there's a relief there because I think if people go about tackling these particular situations and systems with a with a an attitude with a disposition that we can solve this uh and then of course um as i'll explain in a moment that that doesn't play out that can be a that can be a defeating thing and um both for the people making the intervention but also the the people for whom the intervention is being made on behalf of. So in in the uh, paper that Rattel and Weber uh, wrote, they, you know, it may seem a little productive for, for talking about indeterminate things, but they wrote a, quite a remarkable list ten, of 10 rules of, of wicked problems. And uh, it's... It's worth worth hunting out the, the paper. If you just Google it, it'll it'll it'll, it'll come up. We can um, we'll put a link in the okay. show notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the 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 what they were driving at was that the the idea that um, for so the first the first rule was that there is no definitive formulation of a of a wicked problem. So if 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 I have a a complicated mechanical determinant system, say a piece of machinery. Um, the, and it and it there's a problem with it. Uh, there is a defo- definitive formulation, as in it's that, not that. Whereas in these these kinds of situations, the the just the, the naming of a problem is an act of judgment, mm-hmm. and you and I may look at the same situation and come to very different formulations of of what. Uh, what is going on? They also described how the um, the intervention or, or where you start to think you may be intervening is actually entangled with the formulation. So you don't make the formulation and then go about solving it. Uh, as you start to to think about, well, this could be the kind of problem, and this may be what we do about it. That actually creates a feedback loop. The thing that's coming to mind as you describe that is, and it touches on what they were reacting against because the desire to be able to just neatly put things in boxes, say everything is moving through a conveyor belt. It's that whole type of thinking that sees things as a manufacturing process and it sees it as just, uh, knowable Mm. and predictable and that you know even some of those different ideas that that talk about pushing things through different phases till they get to algorithm and it's that aspect Mm. of like okay again only some things 
can be engaged with in that way. And, and I do think that when we come into trying to see our businesses as something that can create a win-win and that is able to have more than just a profit maximization focus, but can actually be taking responsibility and being more intentional and conscious of all of the decisions and the flow on effects of what you're doing, admitting that there's always unintended pieces in there, right? So I'm not being unrealistic on that. But when we do that, again, the the piece that's important as you're going through these, the, the components that they've drawn out that I would love for you to kind of think about as you're listening to this is that we don't want to fall into the trap of getting excited about using our business to have a positive impact in the world, but then put things like engineering processes and time management and, you know, how do we project manage this to within an inch of its life? Like when we put those overlays onto things that are social systems, human systems, environmental systems, it isn't as simple as we can fall into the trap of kind of placing it. And I think that's an important thing to kind of be remembering as you listen to these kind of ideas. Yeah. So the, um, I'll just say a few more things before I get to your point about the, the no right to be wrong, but they, they talked about, um, that, that each, uh, wicked problem is unique as in if you make a formulation, um, because these systems are highly dynamic that, that you, and you go, okay, now we can't do this. Let's come back in six weeks. In six weeks, you need to reformulate. You can't assume that this is a start there's something stable they talked about having no stopping rules as in you don't know when to finish it's an act of judgment you have to go well it's like a piece of art you just need to walk away um there is no definitive test whether a uh, an intervention is right or wrong um and so this is where it starts to really get get gritty get meaty and that is that if you choose to be um, playing in this space, there is that there there, be, there becomes a real, um, I think, I believe very strongly, um, moral ethical dimension to this, and that is that uh, you will uh, the, the intervention that you make will be partial. There will be aspects of it that are wrong. Um, it will it will create unforeseeable and unintended consequences. Um, but as you were raising before, uh, Rattel and Weber talked about that the designer or the planner has no right to be wrong. And for me, that's the that's the real kicker because y- you need to remember that you are intervening in people's lives. You're intervening in in their their habits their routines the way that they operate and you're claiming to want to shift that now you want to shift that into in the direction of good that's fantastic uh but you need to if you want to do that work you are accountable you're on the hook for the impact that that is going to have for uh for 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 real people yeah and i think that this is the piece that even when I think about the responsibility I have as I encourage business leaders to start to think differently about the role that their business can play, the the component here is saying there's a whole bunch of stuff that you're really good at as a leader already and as someone running a, an established business. Part of what we're trying to do is to give the tools and strategies and things that mean you can tune into and maximize your own brilliance, but then identify where you need to call on other people's brilliance because this risk massively increases when we start to muck with things that we literally have no idea about. And and one of those pieces that I have seen happen often is when people still have this approach to thinking about doing good and making money in two different camps and they see the doing good bit as the easy, like, oh, that's the soft stuff and the, you know, we'll go and help yes. over there. Yeah. Or when it's a 
multi-generational family business. It's that you let the younger generation do the philanthropy. Or, and it's like, this is the do-do-do little warning <laughs> for us all to kind of say, no, sorry, that's the hard stuff, right? Yeah. That's where the trickiness yeah. kicks in and we don't let the kids play with that, right? So this is an important point, um, which I think, again, and part of why from that both end perspective, I always bring the no right to be wrong and connect it back with the aspect of a designerly disposition is so that we don't get overwhelmed and then do nothing because we think, oh, I have no right to be wrong and I don't know what I'm doing, so I won't do anything because then that goes to the you know, analysis, paralysis, and you just get, yeah. you, you're so scared to get it wrong. But as you said, you are going to get it wrong. Like there will be aspects. So that, that I think is just a really important um, piece for us in the business space to keep in mind to not see these things as the nice little helping, but they're actually deeply, you know, have significant and serious consequences. Yeah. yeah. I think that's such a great point. And, you know, you, I'm not speaking to every business, of course, but you may have, say, a technical, a business that, that, that trades in some technology and there's absolute expertise and, and finesse and difficulty and knowledge and, and that's, that's wonderful. But you're exactly right, uh, is if you then, from the very best of intentions, want to go and um, intervene in some social situation. You're right. That's that is the tricky stuff. Yeah. So I, I think that's where this idea of design and disposition um, can be really helpful. So perhaps if I could just talk to design and disposition on its own for for a moment, and then we can look at at how bringing those two things together can yeah. be a yeah. can be a really useful idea. So um, I I don't know if this is used in a more uh, in a, in, a, in a in a more broad context. If other people use this particular a term, but it was a term a phrase that um, myself and a colleague came to uh, a number of years ago when we were training um, organisations in uh, bringing a design approach into the in into their organisations with with respect. To the way that they did system change process improvement whatever and it was as a a counterpoint to as you mentioned before this more engineering informed way of going about that which in turn speaks to a very deep metaphor of organization which is that of a machine which has a you know a long history in the 20th century and then we can have another kind of conversation about that at some stage but one of the things that we noticed and we uh, should have perhaps twigged this far earlier than we did but we could provide all the process all the tools the design um, uh, craft we could do um, projects with the, with these people and, and these were you know they were bright they were capable they were competent but they weren't um they weren't schooled and skilled in in design and what we noticed was what they were missing was what we called a design disposition and what was interesting was that the, the my colleague was a designer and um and she had never been taught design disposition but just through the almost like an osmotic process uh these designers would absorb this way of um of uh, and i think it goes beyond just thinking it's being it's a it's a kind of like an ontological stance if you like so the idea of a, dis, a design disposition and and if i can maybe break it down to a few parts is is the first is that uh is 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 to be um endlessly in wonder that's sort of this open curious you know inquisitive uh stance um with respect to the world this sort of always wondering and noticing and hmm, you know how could that be you know be be different or better and the thing that we want that that um that i i, I believe design dials into is is where people are having problems not that people are the problem so where are people struggling within a particular system or a process or a situation 
Yeah, I love that because I, even that reframing so much of the components of how we might think about a problem or come at something has these maybe unintended, at least unconscious power dynamics to it. And as soon as we are engaging in a way that the person is the problem, then there's all these aspects of coming in with the answer and being the savior and, you know, like a whole bunch of really unhealthy things that happen. So that's a beautiful thing of like that. Where is there? Can you say it again? What? So it's not the, the person's not the problem. It's where people are having a problem. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. So then I think the, the other really important thing, and this is perhaps speaks to my um, work on design and that is that there is a lot more available for design than we perhaps might otherwise think and um because we're very used to and we're very familiar with the material design culture um but if we think about what sits within the realm of human artifice what is human made that is that is everything that is not natural so Democracy, organizational structures, um, cultural institutions, um, relationships, exactly. And so we can think about those things as all being uh, available to design. Um, but that's kind of brings in a little bit of the wicked problems dimension of, well, yes, just because you can say redesign a cultural institution, you need to be aware that you have no right to be wrong. You're starting to play with, with, with people's lives, but it is available for, for design. Um, I think the, so that, that, that idea of the wider range of um, mutability is a really important one to, to grasp because not everything can be um, resolved by just throwing technology at it. And particularly in the, in the space, in that, that philanthropic space. Yeah, and not even just throwing technology at it. I think it, it comes back to this piece again of just deeply misunderstanding how interconnected things are and how unintended consequences work, that we either try to do the piece of like, it's almost like we hope that you can throw the technology at it and it will solve it. Or the other thing that I see over and again is people thinking if we just give it more time or if we just give it more money or like, so it's this desire to put a kind of simplistic solution onto something that is not, yes, yes, yes. It is not knowable is not the piece of sit it on the shelf and it'll still be the same in six weeks. Like it, that's not what we're dealing with. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Um, and that, and that's always a judgment call, uh, cause we're talking about, um, good, less good rather than right, wrong. And so when to what, what is good is always a question that has its own needs, its own conversation when to, um, when and who says it's good, like who's, whose opinion and judgment matters in that, exactly. which is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and when to when to stop or when to change change your approach? That's yeah. That's always that's an, there's an ongoing almost like meta conversation required to be uh, to be um, watching the way any kind of intervention is proceeding. And that's where I find the like say if we go to your piece of the having this toolkit of heuristics or the thinking tools, different strategies, all, all of these things, the more that you have that you can call on, I think you can start to relax more mm -hmm. into the need to be able to make fast and quick decisions, to be able to make the judgment call, which is, and again, I am a broken record on this one, but that is something that if you keep trying to push away, that part of your job as a leader is to actually make judgment calls and be discerning. <laughs> that's a cop out. Like that's our job. No one else is going to make those decisions. We have to make those. And so part of this conversation and some of the beautiful components of understanding the designerly disposition and then cultivating those tools within your kind of skill set is that you can start to be more comfortable that something hasn't earned permanence or that it is going to change. And so 
don't do the design thing that is so often people's full concept of design is making something look pretty or graphic design like so don't make it look good actually the the rougher you keep it for as long and then it don't make it look like it's earned permanence when it yes. hasn't kind yeah. of thing <laughs> i think there's if i just want to pull that apart a little bit there's something about aesthetic there in that good thing uh, attractive things just work better but the the point you're getting to with provisional quality is really important and i wanted to speak to that a little bit later but i think one of the problems with the way that we present a lot of information particularly ideas and we we reach for the the presentation technologies that we have uh, available is that whether something whether you thought of something on the bus on the way to work and it is the it's the sketchiest idea or you've thought about something deeply for 12 years you stick that in a in a presentation piece of presentation software and they both will look the same and so it especially if you throw some statistics <laughs> in or you know or some, an infographic brand some clip art maybe clip art oh, no, i don't think anyone uses clip uh, art anymore darling <laughs> um yeah so this kind of brings me to the next point i wanted to make about um design leaders position and that is that you want to cultivate this way of, of being where you enjoy failure. You, you want to invite failure. The, the, the earlier uh, you can fail, the quicker you can, you, you, can, you can learn. You also want to just delight in critique uh, and, and where someone comes to you and goes, mm, that's a Gee, that's interesting uh, and not interesting in a good way. Um, have you thought about this or that looks like that's going to happen? And you, rather than closing that down, you're going, you're, you're going to want to go, oh, really? Come and, come and say more. And that's where provisional quality comes into play because if you present something in a way that looks finished, that almost closes permission for people to uh, offer their their input if you keep something very sketchy very hand-drawn very open that actually invites uh, a conversational um a conversational uh, you know a conversational input um so just one more thing i wanted to say was that um the uh, enjoying failure inviting critique but then just delighting in knowing nothing i think this sort of radical beginners uh attitude because if you, if you are in a determinant space, being an expert is good. I've just had shoulder surgery and I wanted my surgeon to be an expert and he was, hooray. <laughs> in an indeterminate space, because we're dealing with these unique, social, um, hyper complex problems, we don't know. We fundamentally and profoundly do not know. So we need to delight in that and go about furiously learning uh, what um, is going on and what will help. And the place that we go to learn about that is the, con is the constituents of that system, the people who right. inhabit that system. The, um, I want to go back for a moment to some of the aspects around the provisionality and the not making something look polished and finished and like it's earned permanence. The, um, just as a little story to kind of illustrate how that plays out and, and how you can put that into practice in your organisation. So years ago, if you remember, when I was um, running TDI, each of the meeting rooms we had was named after a Frank Gehry building and we had kind of the sketch of that building on the, on the door and we had a big, I always had a big Frank Gehry sketch up above my desk and part of the, the way that we were trying to instill the designerly disposition in the team and the way we as an organisation were operating was to have those little prompts and reminders everywhere. So as we were starting a project or I'd ask a team member to work on something, I'd kind of point at the Frank Gehry and say, make sure you bring it to me while it's the rough sketch. Like, please don't wait till it's beautiful and you're in love with it and you've spent so much time that two things happen. One, 
you're going to find it hard to take that critique. So you're to your point of like, because at this point you're so invested in your solution or your design. A bunch of money has been spent. Yeah. That it's hard to let go of. So it's important to have practices and prompts where you can say, just reminding you as you go into this project, bring me the sketch, the Frank Gehry. Don't bring me the beautiful finished artwork that's you know gorgeous and polished so there's those types of practices that you can do to kind of help instill the the reminder and the disposition in the way you actually operate and then catching yourself so we did a project years ago where brad and i had mapped out um, what we were calling the field guide for the team around like the the different ways we were um, running the program and what was required and it you know, we'd done a lot of work, but it was in the provisional. We were testing it with the team and we were going to then tweak it over and over and kind of refine it till it got to a place where, to your point about the constituents, that it actually was serving the the people it was (laughs) aiming to be actually, you know, for. And when I got the, I've got them here somewhere actually, when I got the folders, uh, and all the the papers printed up to put inside the folders. The first time they were printed, the printer had used the wrong paper and it was shiny. And you were like, oh my goodness, we can't use that. Like we can't give that to people and have these polished, like even something as simple as the shininess of the paper, which made it harder for someone to just with their pen or their pencil scribble on it. And it also aesthetically gave a sense of like, it almost looked laminated, like it was formal and done. And your reaction was a really strong one and rightly so, because even if you think about yourself in different situations, if someone brings you something and asks for feedback and you can tell a lot of money, a lot of time, you know, has been spent, or even if it actually hasn't, but it just looks (laughs) like it has, your feedback will be different and you will be a bit more guarded and you'll kind of, whereas if it was that Frank Gehry piece, you know, there's lots of stories about Gehry buildings where in the sketches you're then able to go, oh my gosh, that whole wing needs to be on the other side Mm. and it's not too late to change it, right? So I think there's some stories that I think just are practical ways people can think about it in the context of your business. So I think the, and, and it becomes a, it's a management culture, uh, it, well, it starts with management culture because, um, and it's and it's the ma- management or managers understanding leaders understanding um, where something is more determinate, where is it more indeterminate. So, um, I think this approach can apply to both. But if you are calling for someone someone's expertise on a determinate technical issue, you maybe don't want them to be sort of hand drawn sketchy about it. But if you are calling for somebody's judgment input on the indeterminate situation then you absolutely want it to be here here's my very first and i know incomplete um sketches sketches out and when it when we um draw back in now this idea of um no right to be wrong in a indeterminate space wow where does the designerly disposition uh and that kind of radical unknowing it stands of radical unknowing um, comes into its into its own is that you will go about that work uh, in a deeply iterative way, and so the idea of of fast and cheap and light prototyping becomes important. So I can start. We can start to gather ideas, and and I and I'm hoping that that most of the ideas are gathered from a constituency. That's that's another point. Is that the designer. As a designer, it's not your design. You are just simply working on behalf of uh, a constituency. You are catalyzing, you are helping, you are centering, whatever you're doing. But it's it it's a design that belongs to a constituency. Um, and with each fast, small, rapid prototype, you want to expose that to to failure. You want to expose that to as as sharp as critique as you can and then learn furiously go again and through that process um uh, or or that approach that um and that method uh you can work uh with that both and seemingly 
uh, <laughs> contradictory perspectives of indeterminacy and, and, and no right to no right to be wrong. And and you will arrive at an intervention, and hopefully that makes pe- people's lives in that situation system better. But you, you then know that that will have created that will, it will be partial, and it will have created unintended consequences. So be ready to just ready to go again. The other piece that you have always said to me that I've found helpful when you think about some of those aspects and how to not feel paralyzed by the hugeness of no right to be wrong and how to engage in those ways with others while thinking about what's my role, what's theirs, is you always said to me, you know, that the aspect of they're bringing content, you're bringing form. And, and so, it, again, it's not always the case because we make those – you have to <laughs> be discerning and make a judgment call of what situation am I engaging with. But I actually think when you go to this piece of constituents or you're talking about beneficiaries or any of these words, part of actually honouring their role, if you in your own mind started to say, oh, they're bringing content, you then respect them more because you're saying, I actually – need to listen to, draw out, capture what it is you're bringing because otherwise we fall into that thing of like, oh, I'm the one with, I'm the designer or I'm the person creating this solution here. And you, even if all your intentions are great, you are going to fall into that trap of not only bringing form, but you bringing the content and then delivering to someone your finished design, which if we go right back to what you said at the beginning, it's like that's the opposite of, of how design really works in the sense of creating change in these types of yeah. places. I think as, that's, a really, you know, as, that's a great point. You know, there's, a, there's a hubris in, in, in thinking um, I, I'm, I'm the expert in your lived experience. It's like, <laughs> so, so again, this it, this the stance of radical unknowing of uh of absolute naivety in the face of 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 these situations and systems and and uh wanting just delighting desiring a constituency to come forward and say hey this is what it's like to be in these situations and these could be the ways that we can we can um we can change and and uh and improve um i think the um can I, before you go on to, because I know that there's other aspects of this that are really critical to pull out, but could we, for a moment, and this is a bit of a cheeky question, you may not be able to answer it, and also you may not be the right person to answer it, but... <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> you'll, you'll understand in a moment. When you're talking about these aspects of, you know, the radical honesty about you know, I don't know, and the being a novice and not having to be an expert. I totally agree with that and love that piece of putting myself in the position of being a novice and having to learn quickly and stuff. But multiple times in my life when I have either read things or we've been having a conversation, I have been conscious of the fact that for a man to walk into a setting is a different piece for someone who is in a not very well represented or um, traditionally oppressed group or different gender or different orientation. If you aren't someone who when you walk into a room, it is assumed you're capable if you have to prove yourself, and this is a whole, this is a massive conversation, but I just love if there's any gut reactions related to some of the designerly components of working with that, because I think that's a massive thing that the problem is a lot of the stuff that's written is written by men who can then say, just go in and be honest that you don't know something. And yet for a lot of people, you can't actually do that until you have proven you're capable and you should be listened to. Uh, yeah. Tell me if it's a too big and we, it's well, another, that's, it's that's another conversation. I'd love but to dig into that. Um, maybe we talk about wow. it in another time. Yeah. <laughs> I think though the, that in a, again, if we, if we, 
draw a distinction between determinate and indeterminate or technical and sociocultural, uh, you know, there's a neutrality to technical problems. It doesn't really matter who or where or, but you know, it's, it's the piece of what, you know, it's the, it's the piece of technology, if you like, that you're fixing. Whereas in these situations and systems, oh my goodness me, absolutely. Power, power dynamics, privilege, all radically play into that. And so there is this delicate balance of what the, uh, the ancient Greek would call ethos, which is kind of this idea of stature. Is this person worth listening to? Uh, however, um, if we are both in an expert culture and a culture where there is a certain demographic that is assumed to almost have walk up stature, then yeah, exactly. Are you just simply per perpetuating power dynamics that are just helping no one? And so that is a very nuanced and fascinating thing to untangle. And I think even in the, the the design of a design, this is like a meta design, there's layers of design, is to how would you address that power dynamic? Um, how would you make sure that this is just not simply accidentally perpetuating um, a particular very unhelpful um, and undesired power dynamic? Uh, the, the counterpoint then is you could say, well, ah, oh, isn't that where we should just give this to the to the kids, perhaps? Um, but um, there is a role for experience. There is a role for having accumulated, um, you know, little fragments and, and bits, and you know, we might call it wisdom, but um, let's not go that far. But um, I, I would like just to draw an example to of um, uh, there was a the idea in, in um, medieval kind of monastic uh, circles of a highly prized skill of being able to uh, extemp extemporize on, on, on any topic. Their chosen topic was to do with um, the Christian God. Can I no, just no. extemporize? Do you mean like just do an impromptu speech? Yes, yes. Yes, so not yes. prepared, like you just could talk about could it. talk about yep. it, yes. So these, these were uh, literate people. They could write. So it wasn't as if it was just the culture was just simply an oral culture. But it was well understood that in, in order to be able to do this, and this com uh, comes to your point that you raised before about the heuristics and the devices and the mm -hmm. tools is that you needed to have a rich storehouse of, of um, experiences and memories and tools and devices. And, and, and uh, they also had a, like, like could be called a craft of memory <clears throat> of a trained mem memory m mnemonic processes that allowed them to pull this forward and organize it on the fly. But there is, there is a place for experience, um, for uh, lived, you know, lived history, for, ha for having that, to be able to be able to see into a system and offer, offer patterns. But, and this, this comes down to then, where does that experience sit? Because it would be assumed in a current culture that that's the leader. Whereas that may be someone who is best actually sitting behind the scenes and the actual design, uh, uh, and I, I don't want to use, I, I use the word process, but it's an, I, I use it accidentally. I don't like that word applied to this, the design um, method or flow, the flow of the design um, may actually be led by a very different um, constituency and the yeah, yeah yeah and hopefully plural like not one like it's oh, a piece absolutely. of absolutely it, because yes. again I think that's the piece of we can then fall into the trap of having a token representative or a something and it's like the more and richer that group is yes. the more representative it is of the system you are truly trying to actually be designing with and for and yeah. and then once again it's a judgment call as to you, you know, you cannot have a design team that's the entirety of the constituency of a, of, of a system. So it does need to be a, um, um, a represent, re representative kind of cut. And all of these pieces, I feel like every single thing that you're saying has that aspect of both and in it. Because in any of these things, you could then ask questions that were like, oh, but hang on a minute. Like mm. to wherever your question goes, my answer would be yes. 
they're both true. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> two things can be equally true, and and I think that 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 piece is is going to just keep coming up. Of you need to have representative voices. It can't be everyone. Yeah. You need to have voices of experience and authority, but it can't be just you know like yeah. we have to have different voices. And so I think all of those pieces are worth just sitting with and being conscious of. And maybe even it's just that piece of, again, the practice of asking the question rather than just assuming, because I've been in enough design processes to, again, with people with good intentions who think that they are designing in this way. And yet when you then ask questions about okay, how are we really actively making sure that the right voices are in here? Or how are we making sure that when we look at something like medical research, actually all of the statistics show that women aren't included in that. And so we're creating (laughs) solutions for things that work for men and then just putting that solution onto other people. But I have been in those situations so many times, Brad, where then I'm told by the designer, oh, no, of course, no, there'll definitely be a gender lens and there'll definitely... But you can't say that when all the evidence says there isn't mm. and you have no intentional way of bringing that in. And so to your point of the having this, the, the tools and the different things to call on, we don't want these and we're not just talking about these strategies and thinking tools and heuristics as um, to like make you feel clever and then put in the bottom drawer. They're things we want you to master and be using in these situations and calling and then going, no, that's actually not the right one to use here. What's a different way I could look at that? Yeah. So maybe I could just say uh, th- three, three things to maybe to, um, to wrap to wrap up yeah. and, and that is that um, one of the lo- one of the lovely definitions of design is is very simple is just is forethought is, is simply the use of, of um, the gift that we have of imagination to be able to conceive of something that doesn't exist in the in the world and so we we exist in a, in a culture of 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 action of we want to actually not that's a whole other topic action versus movement um the number of workshops i've been in where people go no no i just want to know what my task is it's like oh. uh and it, there's this there is this tension between moving towards some kind of resolution but also doing sufficient forethought and so there's layers of of that forethought the first one is that um and i'll, and I'll evoke another retell uh, rule, which was every wicked problem is a subset of a higher order problem. And so what we need to be alive to is the idea that, you know, we're not, we can't tackle the entirety of, we can't solve world hunger. Um, what we need to do is recur down through sub smaller and smaller systems till we find one, we go, okay, I think we can tackle that one. That one feels good. So there's that piece of forethought. The second then is the design, the first act of design um, is the design of a problem, um, of, a, of, a, of a sufficiently robust, satisfying formulation, knowing the, um, the, that it's the, uh, all the problems that, that, that go with that. So that's the, sort of the second act, um, act of design. The third then is that meta design conversation around um, almost the design of the designers is that who needs to be in this room, who, whose voices need to be present and active um, and for what part of this, of this um, uh, intervention. So you might go, oh my goodness me, that's a lot of work before you get to work. But that's what this is. You've got to, you've got to almost suck it up and do that um, and give time and space for that. Otherwise, you will just simply recreate this engineering approach to shoving technical solutions into social situations and, yeah, helps nobody. And kid yourself in the process that the other approaches that look quicker are more efficient. Because, again, if we were realistic and if we actually examined those and looked at how that plays out... The amount of times then we're completely redoing things, we're throwing out 
millions and millions of dollars worth of work, years of effort, quick decisions that are not coming from a place of insight and intention and the forethought kind of are not good decisions. Like let's not, again, it's this piece of, I think we've fallen into traps of often valuing and putting worth in the wrong yeah. things. And it's, and it's not, um, it's understandable because we are, uh, we are receiving a, a heritage, a legacy of the, you know, 20th century manufacturers culture. So those concepts of productivity, of efficiency, of, of effectiveness, they are machine and manufacturing paradigms. Uh, and so it's very hard to not take those as just unalloyed goods and put them into every other situation. So we need to use these ideas as a radical break and say that world of making material things, our material culture, um, as incredible as it is, needs to stay where it is. If we are trying to now do, um, you know, difficult things in indeterminate situations, we need to bring a whole new set of attitudes, um, approaches, um, methodologies, dispositions, thinking, humans to, to, to bear on those situations. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. The... It's just so important and I'm, I'm really thankful to have you speaking into some of these pieces because, well, I've had 20 years now of picking your Sorry. brain. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful thing. I'm very lucky um, of picking your brain and being influenced by your, you know, one of your other words, expansivity and your openness and the, I, I think if there's anything that I can encourage you of as you're listening to this or watching this, you don't have to have the same level of technical knowledge on some of these things as Brad might. He has a PhD on it and he has a different brain to you, but you have different areas of brilliance that he doesn't have or I don't have. So like in any of these conversations, we aren't trying to make you think what we think, believe what we believe, be us, operate like us. But what we are trying to do is really shift you into a place where you are questioning things that you may have previously just taken as a given, like that, like, well, that's just the way it is. We want you to be actually then as some of those myths or narratives start to you question them and, and come at them from a different position, we actually want to be giving you some of the skills and tools and strategies that you can start to replace those old things with and, and play with. They will take time to, you're not going to master them. But, you know, one of the things Brad said today, which was that piece of actually just being excited about always curious, always learning, not only willing to be the novice and go to places where you don't understand, but actually embrace, like actively seek that out. Yeah. As you say, that, that radical unknowing, the, the, the starting place is I am wrong um, and I will fail. And oh my goodness, how cool is that? Yeah. yeah. And, and if we can do that more, that to me is exciting because that is when we actually have a chance of coming up with genuine, and this is another topic we're going to have to have a conversation around innovation. Yes. Oh, Lordy Lord. Um, genuinely come up with this is another really misunderstood topic, isn't it? Oh my God. Genuinely come up with innovative solutions and genuinely start to see some of these things shift because without those pieces we just spoke about and without that design led disposition connected to and equally honoring the fact that when you're mucking with these systems when you are raising expectations when you're doing this stuff that you have no right to be wrong unless we can hold these two things always in tension not be paralyzed by them but actually use them to push us forward in more useful and impactful ways without that we keep having same old same old but we don't change anything yeah. so I I hope that this has been both exciting and a little bit challenging, but not too challenging that you kind of 
get overwhelmed. Um, and we will definitely have have more of these conversations, Brad, if you're up for yeah, it and, and pick and, your brain. Uh, and if they can be driven by questions that, that, yeah. that, that have been raised um, by this conversation, that's, that's, that's even better. That's a yeah, beautiful, live, ongoing uh, discourse about this about this really important stuff yeah yes so absolutely that is a, a good kind of call to action there is rather than just listen if you've got a question if you don't agree with something if you think brad you're full of rubbish <laughs> <laughs> yeah no Helen. keep that to yourself yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then um Wherever you choose to, whether it's on YouTube, on LinkedIn, uh, please ask us those questions, push back, ask for clarification if something didn't make sense. Um, because again, we don't want to just be having these conversations for the fun of it. We actually want to see people's practice change, pe people actually starting to not just think about their businesses differently, but run them differently in ways that actually get different outcomes and create that win-win. So. We'll leave it there for today. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you. It was uh, it was a great great conversation.